welcome to this Cato Policy Forum on do the latest policy proposals improve children's online safety? My name is Jennifer Huddleston and I'm a technology policy research fellow here at the Cato Institute. Today's event, we will be discussing the recent push and focus on children's online safety that we've seen heat up over the last few years and particularly over the last few months. In fact, already in 2023, We've seen this debated on both a state national and national level, as well as internationally, um, in the, particularly in the UK. When it comes to children's online safety, we've seen a variety of proposals that focus on different, different concerns that different families may face. But do these proposals actually improve children's online safety? During the State of the Union, President Biden mentioned a push for children's online privacy. We've also seen the Senate Judiciary host a hearing already on keeping kids safe online, as well as Senator Josh Hawley introduce a bill that would put a, a, an age minimum of 16 on most online social media services. I'm excited to have this conversation today with our, our panel of experts. And before I introduce them, I wanna inform the audience that you can submit questions for our experts via web, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag Cato Technology. Questions will be answered following the conversation, and please feel free to visit the webpage for additional resources pertaining to this discussion. As I mentioned, I'm joined by experts that have covered the issue of technology and particularly the issue of what we're seeing currently go on with children's online safety bills in their relevant jurisdictions. First, I'm joined by Matthew Feeney, who is the head of technology and innovation at the Center of, for Policy Studies in the UK. Before joining CPS, Matthew is the director of the Cato Institute's project on emerging technologies, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, City AM, and many other outlets. I'm also joined by James Ernaski, who is a senior policy analyst in technology and innovation at Americans for Prosperity. His previous experience includes working as a technology and innovation policy analyst at the Libertas Institute in Utah, and as a program coordinator with the American Institute for Economic Research. His, his work has been featured in Real Clear Future, Morning Consult, U.S. News and World Report, and many other outlets. So thank you so much for joining me. As I mentioned, while we've started to hear a lot of discussion of this issue at a federal level, you two have both been part of the conversation that's been going on um, in other jurisdictions as well. Matthew, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the online safety bill that's been debated in the UK. This kind of preceded the debate on policy intervention potentially occurring in the US. What is that bill about and what impact might it have on children's online safety? Sure. Um, well, well, thank you for having me, Jen. It's great to be uh, back at the Cato Institute, if, if only virtually. Um, so you're, you're right to, to highlight the online uh, safety bill. Uh, in, in the time I have, I think I would like to uh, discuss a little bit of the bill's history and uh, its provisions as they relate to the topic of our conversation today, namely uh, child safety and child use of social media. Uh, the bill uh, began back in 2019 as a government white paper that uh, outlined uh, an approach to how the government would respond to a range of, of online harms. Um, it's been on quite a journey uh, since then. It has lived through three prime ministers, two monarchs, six secretaries of state. Uh, it has passed uh, the House of Commons, the, the lower house in, in parliament, and is now before uh, the House of Lords. Um, the bill is uh, enormous uh, and, and tries to tackle a, a wide range of, of harms. Uh, it has provisions relating to fraudulent advertising, uh, as well as um, online speech. Uh, and given the, the, the wide uh, scope of the bill, I thought I would focus on uh, the child uh, safety measures, or at least the provisions that I think will affect children online uh, the most. So the way to think about um, of the bill is that uh, the bill empowers Ofcom, which is uh, basically the, the British equivalent of the FCC, uh, to regulate user-to-user uh, -user and search services, uh, as um, defined in the bill. Uh, and 
these um, requirements, regulations, obligations are backed up by pretty significant fines. Uh, so, for example, uh, failure to comply could result in a firm uh, being fined up to 10% of global, global revenue. Um, throughout the uh, history of the bill, many people may have heard of some of the phrases such as legal but harmful, uh, this rather disturbing phrase. Uh, that was was thrown around. Um, the latest version of the bill does not include that, but I think crucially, uh, that um, sort of provision does survive uh, for children. I, it's worth emphasizing, I think, that much of the motivation for the bill, um, its its widespread support across um, major political parties in the UK, is is motivated in part by um, specific concerns around children children's use of social media. There have been um, very prominent uh, and tragic cases here in the UK of uh, teenagers uh, committing suicide after viewing certain content. Um, there's been widespread concern about bullying uh, on particular platforms. And that is still um, a, a major concern for, for lawmakers today. So the bill does include uh, protection duties for, for children in particular. Uh, and this is where um, legal but harmful does survive. So it does impose a duty on um, user to user services like social media platforms uh, to prevent um, children from accessing uh, that kind of content and actually lists uh, methods such as age verification as one way to do this. Uh, the, the, the phrase in the bill is primary content that is harmful to children. Uh, it's widely expected that uh, that such content will include things uh, or, or content that is legal but harmful, such as uh, promotion of suicide, uh, promotion of eating disorders, uh, self-harm, um, things like this. Um, I also want to, uh, of course, mention that, that the bill is very focused on uh, CSAM, um, child sex, sexual uh, abuse material. Uh, and, and here, I think uh, there is one particular measure that should worry um, civil libertarians, namely that the, um, that the bill does allow Ofcom to demand that a user to user service um, search messages, both private and public, for that kind of material. Uh, this has been uh, widely criticized uh, as a threat to end to end encryption. Uh, unfortunately, the bill does not do a very good job, in my view, of defining user to user service. Uh, and while I think a lot of lawmakers who have been involved in the crafting of this bill envision household name platforms like Meta and Instagram, TikTok and um, such services, the fact is that the bill um, brings tens of thousands of businesses in scope that have nothing to do with social media. Uh, and in this particular section dealing with um, private messaging, people have been talking about uh, the risks um, to services such as WhatsApp and Signal, which utilize end-to-end -end encryption. As the bill is written, uh, Ofcom would be uh, allowed to tell a service, including WhatsApp, that they must search for certain material using a particular kind of technology. Um, and of course, with end-to-end -end encryption, that's um, uh, impossible. Uh, I, I will also... Uh, add that the bill gives quite a bit of power to the Secretary of State to add um, particular kinds of content uh, to uh, the legal but harmful category for children. Uh, so uh, the, the, the list that you may have for, for harmful content uh, may well increase in light of certain trends or, or, or news. Uh, that is, I think, the, the, the main um, provisions I'd like to highlight in relation to child safety. Uh, the final one I will mention is the obligation on uh, providers of pornographic content um, also have a, an obligation under the bill to uh, implement methods to ensure that children don't access the content. And again, here the, um, the bill does mention age assurance or verification as an approved method. Uh, so with that, um, I'm happy to turn over uh, back to you, Jen um, and James, and looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Matthew, for, for that overview, particularly for some of our viewers who, who may not be as familiar with what's going on with this particular proposal in the UK. And part of why this particular proposal is of so much interest is that it does seem to have been the inspiration, so to speak, in some ways, for what we've seen at a state level. 
James, I know your work has largely focused on a state level. Could you give us a bit of an overview of what we're seeing emerge on the proposals to uh, regulate the internet, particularly around the issue of child online safety in the states? Yeah, thanks for having me. And I think that when we're looking at the issue of child safety, it's not surprising that um, the proposal that, that Matthew was outlining in the UK has certainly been imported into the United States. I think that states have realized that uh, the federal government is going to be very slow in acting in this area, mostly because they have many considerations that they have to deal with. Um, so they're going to try to take the lead here and, and put out their ideas onto the table, uh, whether they are good or not, or should be done. Uh, that's an entirely separate conversation. But I think what you've seen emerge in the states are basically two competing models. One uh, kind of goes through the age assurance that Matthew briefly highlighted, which is California's model of uh, the age appropriate design code bill. Uh, this legislation uh, was far reaching in impact in terms of who would be covered and what it would require of companies in terms of their responsibilities, imposing a duty of care and potential liability uh, imposition on the companies that uh, violated the chapter of California statute in this instance. Uh, or you have the age verification route, which is something that we've seen pop up in Utah. It passed their legislature uh, during this session, unfortunately. Um, and that is trying to impose requirements on social media companies to verify the age of their users and then take certain other precautions in order to protect those those minor account holders uh, from either being searched for by uh, different people on the network, being able to add them or message them, um, as well as also having other kinds of sweeping provisions that are pretty alarming, like mandating that parents have complete access to their child's account, which includes messages that they might have um, between users. And that certainly presents a lot of uh, privacy concerns, as well as anonymous speech concerns, more broadly speaking. So I think that when we're looking at these state proposals, broadly speaking, it's trying to set artificial thresholds that only the social media companies can hit. I think that what you're seeing here is that they're being designed in such a way to only target those companies um, because of the perceived harms that are there. Uh, it's also aiming to tackle the issues that I think Matthew's highlighting where we see certain ills, um, whether that's teen mental health, uh, where there are certainly valid concerns, but then they're going a step further uh, and, and adding in some extra, you know, twists, if you will. So like I know in Utah's bill, for example, it has language that would go and fine a company uh, for addicting somebody to their platform if they were a minor. And particularly if they were under 16, there is a rebuttable presumption that the companies would have to disprove the claim that they caused the harm to that particular account holder. So there's a lot of very interesting questions that get raised as we're seeing states tackle this issue. And it's been very interesting from my perspective, working with the various states in terms of trying to address these concerns that we're seeing and trying to mitigate against people's privacy getting undermined and their online anonymity being undermined as well. These are issues that we've deeply cared about for many years that we continue to fight on and we'll expect to continue to fight as we're looking forward to other proposals getting introduced in other states around the country. Thank you so much, James, for that overview. And I think we'll probably dig in a bit more to, to some of the state proposals as we go throughout our, our question and answers uh, session here. And as a reminder to our audience, if you have questions, you can submit those either via the, the app where you're watching or via Twitter using the hashtag Cato Technology. Um, Matthew, you mentioned a bit about the impact that the online safety bill could potentially have on encryption and on a variety of other companies. Can you tell us a bit about the reaction from various companies um, as the online safety bill has approached what is likely to be an enactment and what that might mean for users both in the UK as, as well as those of us here in the US? Right, it's a good question because uh, obviously uh, the many, many companies are going to be pulled into scope by the online safety bill. And many of these companies won't be based in the UK. Uh, many of them are based in, in California, for example. Um, you have seen uh, encrypted services such as Signal and WhatsApp publicly state that they are not willing to compromise the, uh, the, the privacy or the security of their users, uh, which um, if the online safety bill is passed as written, will mean that they will uh, be in a position of having to leave the United Kingdom, which is which is astonishing given uh, the number of uh, 
British people who, who use WhatsApp, uh, it was one of the things that struck me when I moved from the US back to the UK is, is how, um, how common WhatsApp is. Uh, you've also seen um, Proton, the, the company that builds Proton Mail and other encrypted uh, services have also said that they will uh, you know, do their best to comply without um, compromising user privacy and, and security. Um, outside of those um, specific end-to-end uh, -end encrypted services, you, I, I think um, it's fair to say that, that many household name big companies are just preparing for a time uh, when this is law. Uh, and, and that, I think, uh, raises concerns that go well beyond um, in, encrypt, encryption, namely the, the potential anti-competitive elements here. Uh, most of the companies that will be in scope uh, do not have the army of lawyers and engineers that Meta and Google have, for example. Uh, and it's quite worrying to me that a regulator will be empowered by the bill to mandate certain best practices or uses of technology uh, in, uh, to tackle the, the range of online harms. Uh, and th there's a worry, I think, that some of the powerful market incumbents could showcase a lot of their technology, uh, which would be of trivial cost for them to deploy, but a significant cost uh, to smaller competitors and uh, having Ofcom recommend uh, expensive services. Uh, so there's certainly risk to, to privacy. There's a risk to free speech that we can get onto um, later, but I think there's also a very... Uh, worrying anti-competitive elements, um, given how some of the companies are reacting to what seems like the inevitable passage of this bill. Thank you. And James, I know in the kind of general data privacy debate, we talk a lot about the potential consequences of an emerging state patchwork of consumer data privacy laws, and particularly whether or not CCPA, now CPRA, California's data privacy law has become kind of a, a de facto national standard. As we're seeing these potential um, children's online safety bills emerge at a state level, is a patchwork also a concern there? And you know, if I'm not located in California or Utah right now, what if any impact could this have on, on users outside of those states? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think when we're looking at California and that consumer data privacy question, the patchwork kind of gets undermined when California is just basically forcing a compliance-based model onto everybody else uh, in the country. So that certainly is a unique problem that California has created, but also what compliance looks like is different for every single company. So the cost can be radically different depending on what you're talking to there. And I think that that's something that would emerge here as well. If different states have different proposals for what kids online safety would look like, if you're a company that's operating in this space, what compliance looks like could get very dicey pretty quick. And I think that, you know, it also creates a bad perverse incentive for states to want to race to the bottom, if you will, in creating more stringent requirements uh, in order to go and have that de facto standard. And that is, again, not necessarily a great place that we want to be. That's not something that we want to encourage. And again, it what what you find is like, for example, this was based off of like GDPR in nature, where you saw that in order to go and have your exercised right to be forgotten, you actually had to turn over more information in the process of being forgotten. So that way they could go and exercise that. We saw similar things happen with CPA and CPRA with their forms that are gonna happen here. But when it's focused on kids, what's gonna happen is, is that you all have to verify that you're not a kid in this instance. You have to all prove that negative which means that you have to turn over some form of government ID uh, or perhaps submit yourself to a facial recognition scan to do age estimation. And in these instances, it, it is certainly presenting a very unique problem for, for kids and adults alike. So that's why I think that this patchwork doesn't work because depending on what states are doing, what compliance looks like looks very different. And again, kind of like what Matthew said, I think it echoes similar here. Like if you're a big company like Meta or Google or Microsoft, Compliance here might not necessarily be too big because you have the legal team to figure it out, right? But if you're a smaller company that's emerging, it creates a very unique problem for you in terms of how do you want to actually engage in growth of your platform and, and actually attract users to your platform if all of a sudden you hit this arbitrary threshold, which many of these bills do have. And in Utah's case, it was as little as 5 million global users. That's a lot of companies that would get implicated immediately, right? And that, that triggers a lot of compliance cost. And that is not something that a smaller company can afford as easily as a bigger company. So it would actually deter investment in this space and deter innovation in terms of uh, you know, exposing users to new kinds of content or new kinds of 
ways of delivering services to them that they otherwise have been accustomed to in a more light touch approach that we've had in the United States historically. Thank you. And kind of picking up on something James brought up with the, the ID element that could, could emerge, um, to both of you, do you find that these proposals around online safety only impact children and young people or what, if any, impact might these proposals have on kind of your, your everyday internet user who's over the age of 18 as well? Uh, well, I think that it would be rational for a lot of uh, prominent uh, social media platforms to engage in over moderation if something like the online safety bill uh, is passed. You might say, well, look, uh, the, the government got rid of the, the legal but harmful requirement for adults, but kept it for children. But if you, if you are a platform that's dealing with billions of pieces of content every, every day, uh, or um, you know, hundreds of hours of video being uploaded every minute, you're in a position where you have to determine um, which of your users are children, um, and then figuring out how to make sure you steer them away from a list of harmful content. Uh, and, and for a lot of firms, I think they will, um, given the punitive uh, fines attached to uh, the online safety bill, I think they will engage in uh, an abundance of caution uh, and remove a lot of legal and valuable speech. Uh, and uh, that, that I think is, is going to affect uh, many, many users who are not children, uh, many adults who uh, have genuine uh, personal, academic, or professional interests in a whole host of topics that might get get wrapped up into um, this regime, um, I, I think would suffer. I mean, something that's very um, crucial to understand is that uh, if you require firms to um, ha treat children differently, then you're asking them to find out which of their users are children, um, and that that is not uh, that is not free. Um, that is a cost. And for many firms, I think it will just be cheaper to um, err on the side of caution and assume all users are children. Uh, and uh, I think that would have a, a significantly detrimental effect to the state of online speech for adults. Yeah, to follow up on Matthew, I think he hit a lot of really important points and I know I said it in my commentary, so I'll just re-echo it here. The problem when we're talking about age verification or age assurance is that it, re it relies on needing to disprove that claim that you are a child. And for many of these platforms that have mixed user bases of both adults and, and teenagers, um, it certainly presents a unique threat to underlying content that might be present on these platforms. What you could expect to possibly see as a result of this is more manual review of content before it gets up. Right now, these platforms operate on a user-generated content kind of model, which allows a lot more speech to be up but if they're going to fa possibly face liability because they let something go up that might have fit that category of legal but harmful if you're in the UK or, uh, you know, pornographic content, as we've seen in some of these more targeted, you know, instances in like Louisiana um, that's trying to focus on that issue. I think that, again, when you have lawyers that are trying to go and avoid liability and in, instead of hosting your speech, they're just going to avoid that liability. So I think that you'll see a shift away from user expression online. That certainly would be a, a net negative, I think, for people if that's what we saw happen as a result of this. So I think that we have to be very serious when we're looking at trade-offs that are involved here. I think that wanting to protect children is a noble endeavor, but how about how we exactly go about solving that issue? I don't think that these pieces of legislation actually go and get at that underlying issue there. And how do we actually protect children in a safe and effective way that doesn't compromise the privacy of everybody that's online or the speech of everybody uh, as a result of having anonymous speech online? That is something that can't be understated. I want to kind of build off of this with a question that came in from our audience, and I'm going to combine two of these questions, which is just about kind of how could age verification actually work if these bills become law? Um, you know, one question was, how could a 13 or 14 year old verify their age? They likely, you know, they wouldn't have a driver's license yet. They may or may not have a, a photo ID from a school or a passport, depending on where they are. And similarly, are there any truly effective age verification systems, or is this just going to be, you know, kids learning how to subtract a different number from the, the current year to, to try and get around an, an age gate? I think I'll take a quick step at that. I'm oh, sorry, uh, Matthew. No, go for um, it. Yeah, so when we're looking at age verification, there's 
certainly two primary models that go and get that done. One would require you to submit some form of government uh, documentation that would go and verify your age. So if you're a kid, uh, you're not going to have a driver's license. So that might be a birth certificate or a social security number, something that is certainly a lot more intrusive to your you know, identity in an offline world. Um, and again, the alternative is if you're not doing that, you're submitting yourself to facial recognition technology uh, for facial scans that would engage in age estimation. Um, this is something that we've actually, we don't have to guess whether or not that's done. It's being currently done in China right now uh, in an effort to prevent children from you know, doing video games at night past curfew times uh, that they've imposed there. So it's not like it's some kind of far-fetched thing. Uh, this is actively being done. And I think it's also worth noting that particularly in the conversation around age verification, especially for going through ID oriented styles, one of the largest companies that actually does this is owned by MindGeek, which operates uh, Pornhub and many of those pornographic sites that so many have uh, qualms with right now. So I think that that's just something that's a little ironic uh, to just note that. But again, it's it's something that's that's more or less the two kind of big things that you see that are out there right now is either you're going to have to do some kind of documentation to prove it, or you're going to have to submit yourself to facial recognition, uh, age estimation kind of scans. And I do think that it does create a perverse incentive for kids to figure out how to circumvent these kinds of tools with fake IDs. Uh, many of them nowadays are actually good to pass online uh, verification tools. So that's another thing that uh, I think that is worth talking about too. Yeah, I, I think that was all very well said. I don't have um, have much to add. Um, only that, um, in order to to be like truly effective, I think you're you're compromising child privacy. The the more effective you want this to be, uh, and uh, I think I think James is correct to highlight that there will be um, a race on that uh, once once uh, a age assurance or age verification system is implemented, there will be uh, ways in which to to circumvent it. Uh, I mean, for children in particular, this is uh, uh, difficult because of the relative lack of access to, to government documents. Um, but also, uh, if, if it is going to be document based, I think that just adds um, it adds uh, if it's going to be based on on documents, then it just uh, it provides incentives for forgery. Uh, and, and, and there are other efficiency uh, issues associated with that, um, especially if children are, are seeking information about or, or help for example, about um, abuse at home, um, they may not be in the best uh, position to ask um, for parental permission uh, or for access to certain documents. So yeah, uh, a difficult thing to, to iron out for sure. I think when we you know, are talking about these bills, I know James, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, oftentimes they're, they're coming from a place of what appears to be genuine concern of, of people that, that really are focused on the next generation and, and on their own children's safety or their constituents' children's safety. They've heard some of those horrible stories that you know Matthew mentioned earlier about children who have found harmful content online. But at the end of the day, do you feel that these proposals actually accomplish their goals? Would young people have better privacy protections under what we're seeing at either a, a state level or in the UK with the online safety bill? Um, and, would, and would those privacy protections actually make them safer online? I think that at the end of the day, when speaking to the US proposals that are out there, any marginal benefits that you might have that would come out of these proposals do not outweigh the costs to all users' privacy and all users' anonymous speech online. So no, I don't think that while they are well-intentioned, I do not think that they would actually do anything substantive to improving child safety online. I think that ultimately one of the key issues here is an education issue. We have so many people that feel overwhelmed by the technology and they don't know where the tools are in order to get that tailored online experience that they might want to see for their child. And that's something that is a, is a real challenge that we should tackle. And there are solutions I think that we can do that are more common sense that go and tackle that precise issue. I think the other side of this equation is, especially when we're talking about more radical proposals, like let's say banning all children under 16 uh, from you know participating in social media, let's be real. I don't think that kids are going to go and take that well. Uh, I think that they will go and circumvent that. Speaking as a kid who certainly did have that fight with my mom growing up over the years in an online world. Um, 
So I think that we have to be very real about that aspect of the conversation and also focus on educating children, both on the benefits of social media, because make no mistake, there are benefits for kids using social media. In Utah, when they were doing this bill there, there was a 13 year old girl who actually, she was very brave. She went up there and she testified against the bill saying why she felt that it was, it was actually a net loss for her. Like she felt like this was a great way for her to be connected to her friends. And especially coming out of a pandemic where these platforms were actually a net positive for people to try to get over that distancing problem that we had where we couldn't be in person with each other. Um, I think that that context is pretty important to understanding that. And kids certainly do have those benefits, but then educating them on the possible pitfalls. So that way we can avoid possible downsides uh, of those horrible stories that Matthew kind of highlighted or that we've certainly seen in the news. So that's that's what I would say when it comes to the U.S. side of the equation. I'm sure Matthew has thoughts on the U.K. Yes, um, I mean, I think what I would add there is if you look at at least the online safety bill, it is quite clear that the, the authors of it have abandoned um, I believe any of the nuance that goes into content moderation that we're all um, familiar with. Uh, it is oftentimes the context of content, not the content itself, that will be the deciding factor in whether it's um, removed or um, hidden. Uh, so that, I think, it does um, potentially harm, harm children. Uh, and you can think of a few examples. Uh, so for example, uh, under, um, I believe it's Meta's policy, uh, there is a guidance on how to treat content associated with bullying. So, you know, children at, at school might have, uh, you know, mobile phones and they'll film uh, children being bullied or beaten up or otherwise humiliated and then upload it onto social media to harass and intimidate the victim there. And that is the kind of content that major household name platforms take steps to remove. Uh, but if the same video or, or category of content was uploaded by an anti-bullying charity uh, to say, look, if you've been the victim of something like this, please, you know, here's a, a helpline or here are resources for you. Uh, th that, that charity under the online safety bill, I think, would find it a lot harder to um, get that content to the target audience because the online platforms would have an incentive to over moderate uh, when they've been told that there's a whole category of of content that children just aren't allowed to see. Uh, and so it, it, one of the most tragic things about this bill is not that just that, you know, it's a threat to free speech, it's a threat to privacy, it's a threat to an innovative and competitive market. It fundamentally, the, the, one of the main problems is it, I, it's not clear it's gonna work uh, uh, for, for the reasons um, that, that I've just discussed, but also because of some of the reasons uh, James also mentioned. Uh, and, and that's one of, the, one of the most tragic things about it in my view. You know, I, I really appreciate, James, you you mentioning the benefits of that young people can experience online and particularly for many young people who who are at home trying to stay connected with with friends and family. I think a lot of us, you know, this event couldn't be happening if we if we didn't have the the technology we had that allowed us to uh, to bring in Matthew from the, the UK to to be on a virtual panel um, with those of us in, in D.C. and everything. Um, you mentioned the the 13 year old girl who testified in Utah. I was wondering if if either of you could highlight anything else you've seen about the perspective of young people themselves, um, either on with regards to their experiences online or or with regards to these these bills. Yeah, so I I think that again in Utah it was it was pretty interesting because seeing a 13 year old go up to the state capitol and testify against the bill is not something that you see every day. I, I lived in Utah for a couple of years. I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen, you know, kids actively up there, uh, you know, advocating for something that they deeply care about. So I think that that's telling in and of itself. You know, when we're talking about bills that are concerning kids, I think that it, it would behoove us to not want to have a conversation with the target audience there, children, um, and see how exactly they're feeling about this. For Lucy, it was concerns about, you know, connection and, and being able to have her, her feelings with friends and have resources available for her. I know that there was a high school girl that had testified on the bills later in the process that felt like this would undermine her ability to uh, get access to content that, you know, again, might be deemed inappropriate for children because what's inappropriate for a 13 year old might be something very different than what's inappropriate for a 16 or 17 year old that's technically, legally speaking, still a minor. Um, so I think that, 
you know, because these bills are a little bit too much of a hammer uh, and just finding everything as a nail, uh, you know, you're going to, you know, over overcompensate if you're a platform. And that means that these kids are going to get denied opportunities to engage in an online ecosystem that I think certainly has had benefits for them. And I've seen that time and time again when we're talking to kids. Um, you know, I know that coming from a gaming background myself personally, um, you know, we have a chapter in Arkansas that's working on that with with those kids. Like sometimes that's the only thing that you have that's out there because in high school, if you think that the online world is bad, let me tell you about the offline world, all right? Going to high school, there are bullies there too. Uh, there is a lot of bad stuff that happens in schools and we've seen that be in part because of the videos that Matthew has highlighted and it really uh, breaks my heart seeing that happen. But it also offers an opportunity for us to course correct on some of these things. And the online experience is what empowers that. Kids need to have that resource to be able to go and talk about what's wrong or to go and highlight something that they think is horrible. Um, too. And, and these bills, I think, unintentionally would go and make that a lot more difficult for us to be exposed to that. So that would be a shame. And I think kids, to the best of their ability, are trying to highlight these concerns to lawmakers. And I, and I certainly applaud them for it. Yeah, Jen, your, your question um, is a good one. Uh, it, it actually uh, reminds me of how um, depressing it is that over here, actually, I think um, teenagers and, and children are not asked enough about their views of, of the online world. Uh, I'm trying to recall actually seeing um, or re can't actually immediately recall seeing a, a, a child discussing the online safety bill in the media or, or before a parliamentary committee. Um, not to say it hasn't happened, but it's certainly um, the, the fact that I really am struggling to, to think of an example is, is rather depressing. Um, Oftentimes, at least here in the UK, uh, children are often on on the media and these stories as um, uh, as as victims of online bullying or harassment or uh, the subject of stories because they've um, hurt themselves. Uh, and then uh, you might see some children interviewed who were, were friends with those people. Um, so I, I do think it's really important that lawmakers do listen to children. But at least here in the UK, I would say that children have been um, conspicuous by their relative absence, uh, which uh, is a, a shame given um, the nuances that that James mentioned. Yes, you know, twelve-year-olds are not sixteen-year-olds, and sixteen-year-olds are not seventeen-year-olds. You know, it's uh, to to treat um, children as one uh, one sort of monolith is a mistake. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, that that these bills apply to a, a wide range of of young people. Largely, we're we're talking about teenagers, and and even within teenagers, everything from thirteen year old to seventeen, eleven months, and twenty nine day year olds. Um, when it comes though to parents or policymakers who maybe recognize that there are serious consequences of this legislation, but are still concerned about their young people online are still looking to, to help encourage uh, a healthy and beneficial experience. Are there any resources that, that you both think of that are, are currently available to them? And are there any steps you know, outside of legislation that you've seen various tech platforms take to empower parents or young people when it comes to their online experiences? Yeah. Um, so in order to tackle that, I think that when we're when we're dealing with resources that are available to parents, um, I know the Family Online Safety Institute, FOSI and Stop Child Predators uh, both have excellent resources trying to encourage parents to become better digital citizens. I do think that that is one ma massive part of the solution there is going and empowering parents to be aware of what tools are at their disposal so that they can tailor an online experience to their to their kids' needs um, for what they feel is comfortable for them that is age appropriate, right? So I think that that is one part of the plot, uh, that, that solution there. I think that, um, again, what we've seen pop up in, in some states, um, they're not perfect in terms of how they're written out, but there are some bills out there that are trying to engage on the kids' side of the equation for social media literacy. I do think that there's a lot of value in that because, again, we, need, we do need to talk about that, the fact that there are benefits for social media use for kids, um, undoubtedly so, uh, but also raising the proper you know, concern of where are those downstream uh, negative effects that could have negative implications for children um, if they're not using it properly or correctly. Um, so I think that that's another part of the equation. And I think that the third, the third tier here is on the companies themselves in terms of how are they connecting with parents to empower them with the tools that are there? Like Apple has parental controls already readily available. 
There are lots of apps on the app store that are readily available that can go and provide these much needed filters and controls that parents might be looking for for their kids. Uh, but how do we you know, connect the dots between what the platforms have available to them and what the parents are looking for better? I know that they do targeted advertising online trying to highlight this, um, and that might work for certain crowds, but there are plenty of people and plenty of parents that are working and not necessarily as online to see these opportunities. So I think it's about exploring how we go and again, just further innovate in this cycle here to get parents connected that might not necessarily be as online. So that way they can go and have that resource and not feel like they're just left alone in dust. So that's what I would say. Yeah, it, it's true that uh, some of the, the household name companies already do uh, implement a number of parental control mechanisms that allow for parents to uh, restrict access to um, restrict access to certain sites uh, and allows parents to to, to monitor their, their children's online behavior. Uh, and th this, I think, uh, it, it, your, your question, Jen, raises a, a certain degree of frustration because um, what I think has been missing from a lot of the conversation, at least here in the UK, is um, a conversation around the role of parents, because a lot of these uh, these companies do uh, provide means to uh, restrict access to worrying content, uh, but but they aren't used. And it's been it's been fascinating to be here in in Westminster, seeing uh, the Conservative Party um, introducing a bill that seems to neglect a lot of the uh, non government institutions between the individual and the state that traditionally you would think uh, conservatives would would champion. Uh, so for example, uh, the role of educational institutions, uh, the role of parents uh, and family more broadly, it's, you know, it's something that, that I, I understand is a difficult conversation for a lot of people to have. But uh, ultimately, I think that there, there is more that many, many parents, um, there's more that many parents could do um, in order to restrict their child's access to, to a lot of this um, a lot of the, the the platforms and the content. Now, of course, as James said, that it's not all bad. You know, I'm not I'm not advocating that a, an ideal parent would prohibit their child from accessing social media or mobile phones completely. Um, but on the other hand, it's been very uh, interesting to me that uh, we that that many lawmakers seem to just accept as a given truth that uh, you know 13 and 14 year olds will just spend eight hours on Instagram. And I think like, well, you know, that, that, that doesn't have to be the world that, that um, the, the children live in. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, there are a range, of, uh, a range of mechanisms out there already that parents can use to uh, keep their children safer online, but that doesn't guarantee they're going to be used. I want to turn to some of the questions that have come in from our, our audience today to, to start with kind of a, a more pragmatic one of, let's say there is an age verification element in effect, whether it's, you know, the one of the state laws we've seen proposed or, or the UK's law. Is this a case where users will have to go through age verification processes, every website they they navigate to? Is it something that they would encounter on a daily basis? Or is it something that like, once you're verified on one website, you're done um, for the, for the internet as a whole? Has there been any thought given to what this would actually look like? Um, for the average user, I, I would say for the um, for the U.S. proposals that there's not really much uh, in the way of any kind of controls that would go and account for that. Um, I think that it just anticipates that you would have to verify on every service. Now, again, for the proposals like Utah's, it is explicitly designed with social media companies in mind. So I think that it wouldn't go and apply to every single website, but it would apply to uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram and, um, and, you know, YouTube and, you know, TikTok, uh, which, you know, again, from a privacy standpoint, seems a little odd that we want to, you know, have a company that currently has some, you know, security concerns, uh, collecting more information on, on kids, uh, in order to, you know, continue operating in, in the country. So, um, it's not necessarily applying to every case, but in terms of how effective it would be, again, I think that it's dubious at best. Um, especially with the advent of VPNs and kids going and circumventing through a multitude of means. I'm not sure how effective it would be, but it does pose a legitimate risk to everybody else because, again, we all have to prove that we're not kids. Uh, and that, I think, is a bad you know, a status quo to have to operate under as a you know, starting point. 
Uh, the, the answer to your question in relation to the online safety bill is relatively uh, straightforward because the answer is we don't know. <laughs> um, we know what uh, you know services would be um, expected to do, but it's, it's rather vague and open-ended. So it's possible um, that you could have a system where um, Ofcom decides that you know the best system is actually one where people have to do age verification every time they log in. It might be enough that you do it just to create an account and then you're fine. It might be that um, there's a third party that everyone must go to to do age verification that a consortium of social media sites might view as acceptable. Uh, the answer, it, we don't know. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, the question is a good one because it uh, helps us highlight the fact that um, you can say age assurance or age verification as much as you want, but um, the devil's going to be in the detail insofar as how it's implemented. So our next question is about, you know, the constitutionality of, of these laws. And I, I know that that neither of you are lawyers, but I also know you've you've both paid a, a lot of attention to to the constitutional debates around these proposals and, and related proposals. Um, basically, the question is, how can the government regulation of content and Internet comply with individual rights? The the questioner particularly ask about the 14th Amendment, but also, of course, there are serious First Amendment concerns. Um, Matthew, I know the First Amendment, of course, wouldn't apply to the UK, but as we're seeing US states and, and many other kind of debates about potentially copying elements of the UK bill, if there's anything there you would like to, to highlight, and what, if any, kind of constitutional challenges have we seen to these laws? Um, go ahead, James. Yeah, so on the U.S. side, we've seen uh, litigation behind California's Age Appropriate Design Code uh, bill on First Amendment grounds. So in terms of the constitutionality of the bills, I think it's very much up in the air. I don't think that, you know, there's there is certainly an argument that can be made that they do not survive constitutional muster. Part of that is on First Amendment grounds. I think you could also make an argument for some of these bills on dormant commerce clause grounds. Um, because they are extending well beyond the borders of the state in terms of what's being implicated here. Um, so I think that there are certainly various constitutional arguments that have been made uh, when talking about the problems with this bill. You also have, again, because of the nature of the intersection of what might be problematic content, um, I know that we saw this in other proposals in Utah where there are, you know, um, you know, pornographic content, CSAM, things of that nature. And depending on the reporting requirements, it could also create Fourth Amendment concerns um, as well. So I think that there, there needs to be a lot more thought in general on these proposals to go and strike a proper balance between, again, wanting to protect kids, which I think is a noble endeavor, but also respecting the privacy rights of Americans and the constitutional rights that they are granted uh, for their speech and for, you know, protection against overzealous searches from fishing expeditions that might result as, you know, from having CSAM or other kinds of things that are out there. There are other more narrowly tailored solutions that we could certainly pursue in that effort. So um, we'll see what happens. I anticipate with Utah's bill, which is waiting the governor's signature, um, that should happen, I imagine, uh, before the 23rd of March. I think that's the last day he has to take action on any bills passed during the legislature. But I wouldn't be surprised if that bill um, ultimately faced some kind of litigation, because again, there is a legitimate speech concern that comes with trying to moderate uh, how the internet performs uh, and it's again, it's not just kids that are implicated here. It's impacting all adults. So I think that that's what we that I would highlight. Uh, the the question allows me to showcase uh, how bad the online safety bill is. You know, I, I came to London after years uh, working in DC public policy, uh, working on online speech issues, and uh, the Americans watching um, may may. May, may be, be shocked to hear that I, I think between 80 and 90 percent of the online safety bill would just be unconstitutional on its face if it was introduced in the United States. Um, the UK does not have a Supreme Court that can constitutionally review legislation. Uh, there is no First Amendment. Uh, there, so if Parliament says some speech is illegal, then it's illegal. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is a little frightening for civil libertarians. Uh, and if you're an American who thinks, well, thank goodness I live in the States and I won't have to worry about that. Um, as we discussed earlier, this bill will affect global companies. And it may, as a result, be that Meta and TikTok and other platforms will just adopt uh, the, the UK content moderation style as the default. 
uh, meaning that people all over the world may not be able to access content that they otherwise would if uh, the UK had not passed this bill. We have time for one more question, and this brings in a, another topic that's been in the news a good bit. These days, there seems to be a growing concern about TikTok, um, particularly. Often this is related to national security concerns, but sometimes it's from the perspective of children's online safety. Do you view TikTok as a greater concern than other social media apps, and why or why not? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think that um, certainly with the revelations that have, that have occurred around TikTok, I don't think that you can say that there's no reason for concern. I think that there are certainly some aspects of it that would certainly raise alarm in, in my view. The question is whether or not the, the proposed solutions to that are, are appropriate or not. And in the United States, we've kind of been all over the place on here. We've seen a flurry of proposals that have banned TikTok off their state-owned devices because of cybersecurity concerns. And I think that that's you know, perfectly fine if you're a government, uh, you know, and you have that device, it's your property, you set the rules as to what can and cannot go on there. Um, but then we've also had other proposals that seek to ban it outright. And I know that you just had a piece that was covering uh, the issues that come with a ban of TikTok more broadly speaking. And, you know, good news there is that you're not exactly alone in your feelings. I know Secretary Raimondo has certainly expressed some concerns, at least politically, with what would what a ban on TikTok would look like uh, and what whether or not that's actually feasible. And there are actually certain proposals in Congress that might actually undermine the ability to effectively implement a ban of TikTok. Like, let's say, if you were to force Apple to allow sideloading onto its, you know, uh, its software, right? Like, you could go and circumvent those kinds of proposals uh, that would ban TikTok as a result in theory. So I think, um, you know, certainly I think there's there's some reason to have some concern there, but um, again, the proposals don't quite, I think, match up with what that concern actually looks like. And I think that if you're truly concerned about the privacy uh, issues that TikTok has raised, that's why, and I know you're going to love this, Jen, we need a federal data privacy law passed, right? Uh, I think that that can go a long way towards solving a lot of those issues. It's not clear to me that that TikTok raises unique like social media questions if we're talking about children so uh, i think a lot of people uh particularly worry about um TikTok in the context of national security and its relationship with china uh there i i you know defer to my national security and, and foreign policy uh uh friends and colleagues and experts uh my my view at the moment though is that you know TikTok is engaged in a uh, a global campaign to try and reassure lawmakers all over the world that they are good at um, keeping data uh, away from uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party and that the, the data is housed in a sensible way. Uh, lawmakers across the world uh, in, in Europe and the US, I think, are, are, are worried about the relationship that TikTok has with China. Uh, and and the, that's not um, particularly my, my area of expertise, given um, I'm not a national security policy expert. I would say that that TikTok doesn't raise any unique uh, uh, social media uh, child harm questions. It seems to me, um, although uh, you know many people have highlighted the sort of the, the addictive nature of the the scrolling uh, of video, but but that is is not unique to TikTok. Thank you both for joining us today. Before I close this out, I I want to give you each an opportunity if people want to. Uh, find out more about your work on this topic or on other technology-related topics, where can they find you uh, online? I'll start with James. Sure. If you guys want to keep up with my latest musings on all things tech, you can follow me on Twitter at jamescz19. Um, you can also keep up with my work by following Young Voices, where I'm a commentator and speaker uh, for them and usually talk about all kinds of issues that are at the intersection of tech uh, and, and speech and privacy. So that's where you can find me. And Matthew? Yes, I am, uh, I am also on Twitter at M underscore Feeney, F-E-E-N-E-Y. -E -E uh, and you can read my uh, musings on the online safety bill and other issues at the Center for Policy Studies website, which is cps.org.uk. And once again, thank you both so much for joining us today, as well as to all of our attendees. We had a lot of great questions come in, and I apologize that we could not get to all of them. There will be a video recording of this event available on Cato's website as well. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon.